people are under incredible amount of stress. We need guidance on how to relax. Western medicine doesn't have cures for everything. I can't walk around in like everyday life being high on morphine. We sometimes see patients who are so desperate that they're quite vulnerable. Even if it's a placebo effect, it's still a powerful healing mechanism. If it makes you feel good to do something, that's not wrong. It is wrong to tell you that this could cure your disease. There's a very real human need for whatever it is that these rituals supply. It's not grounded in science or the available data. We need to meet that need or people are gonna start sneaking it in through the science back door. We all want to stay young forever. There's an entire industry that is talking to being dissatisfied with ourselves. But we live in a world full of noise. Celebrity diets, detox. Of science versus pop culture. I'm here to change that. Science and spirituality. Interesting times right now. It's restarting. It's okay. Many ancient health practices are becoming more popular, whether you're talking about acupuncture or Reiki or cupping or even mindfulness. For most of us, science and spirituality seem like mutually exclusive ideas, but perhaps both have a role to play when it comes to our health. Define spirituality for me. Spirituality is to understand yourself in relation to the world. Often it's religion that gives people that sense of belonging to a giant, beautiful narrative of humanity. Take that away and you still have this craving for participating in the ancient, for participating in ancient rituals. Over the last hundred years, we started separating church and state and also spirituality and our health care. But there's growing interest in spirituality and bringing it back into the medical system. If you're more likely to go for your chemotherapy and feel that you can talk to your oncologist, if they kind of offer some of those things, then maybe that's okay, right? Because you're more likely then to get the kind of care that you need. And this overlap between science and spirituality seems to be increasing. In fact, experts have said that the alternative and complementary medicine market will be worth almost $200 billion by 2025, despite the fact that many of them are not scientifically validated. So what is driving the trend? People are under incredible amount of stress. I mean, there's all these natural disasters happening, political crises, and our day-to-day -day life is filled with kind of information overload. People are leading more stressful lives, and with that comes a whole boatload of health issues. It can affect your sleep, it can provoke issues like anxiety or depression. It can sometimes create physical manifestations of stress, so you constantly feel that you're actually having issues of pain. And all this stress is costing us. A report from the American Psychological Association says that the U.S. alone loses billions of dollars a year in stress-related accidents, absenteeism, and medical costs. And with studies finding that 79% of American adults claim they feel stressed, this problem isn't going anywhere. Part of our problem as a society is that we don't know how to relax. We need techniques and we need practices and we need guidance on how to relax. And that's what this is about. Is there a need for relaxation driving this trend in alternative and traditional therapies? Or is there something more to it? Health is increasingly being presented as something that is only the domain of science and medicine. There is something deceptive about the idea that just getting rid of an infection or sewing up that wound, that that's all we need to be fully healed as human beings. These are 200 million year old salt bricks that have been brought in from the foothills of the Himalayas to build our luxury salt room. From the Himalayas? That's correct. So when the primordial oceans dried up, 
what they left were these salt deposits. We're standing on salt. Yes. <laughs> we got, we're surrounded by salt. Absolutely. And, and it's warm in here too. Yes, we've heated the floor. So when you heat Himalayan salt, it begins to release negative ions into the environment, which are gonna help like clear your energy, ground you, relax you. So what are the, some of the things that this room is beneficial for? So you're gonna have this raised concentration of salt where you can breathe it in. Those tiny particulates are gonna move into the body to begin to dry out any impurities within you. So if you had maybe like an infection in your lungs, bronchitis, asthma, COPD, skin conditions, cold, flu, it can begin to move into the body to help clear that out. So tell me about the kind of people that come here. Like who are your clients? Sure. We do have companies that will use the salt room to take meetings. We have yoga classes, and some people just come in and love to just roll around in the salt. The lights in the room will actually change color, so we can do chromotherapy in the room. You'll see anyone from like a six-year-old all the way up into their 70s, 80s. So are people coming in for the spiritual experience or the actual kind of stated benefits? There are, you know, a lot of studies out there which are a little controversial, again, as to the benefits. But there is this moment when people walk in where they just have this overwhelming feeling. I believe it to be the energy of the salt. There's a reason we're drawn to the ocean. It is from once where we came. And so there is an energy to being in this room that really helps you begin to go inward and feel grounded and connected. So do you view it as a, as a spiritual practice or do you see it as something that is actually measurable? Whether you believe in the scientific or the spiritual, if it works for you, it works for you. And so, you know, I think part of any kind of treatment, whether you believe in acupuncture, traditional medicine, hypnotherapy, even if it's a placebo effect, I think it's still a powerful healing mechanism because there's something that you're buying into which helps you feel a lot calmer. Uh, that's interesting because they often talk about placebo theater. Have you heard yep. that? This is quite a theater, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Again, we go back to the placebo effect. If you feel that it's helping you on any level, level, then it's working for you. And it is a placebo theater, right? That's really what is going the on. The theater of the placebo. <laughs> and, and we know that the more money you spend on a placebo, the more likely you are to have a response. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not getting better. I mean, there are many changes that happen with placebo, but it's the spending of the money that's making you feel better, not the drug or you know, whatever else. Do you think there's a danger too with this conflation between spirituality um, and science? You have to sort of look at what's being offered or promised. You know, people have talked a lot about, for example, massage therapy. And does it really improve low back pain? And now there's some studies that say maybe it doesn't. I don't care. I like a massage, but I'm not telling myself that this is going to cure a medical condition. So I think that we've sort of blended this what we get pleasure out of with promising kind of medical outcomes. And, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily so ethical. So do you think it's okay to do that? To give these practices a scientific veneer? The short answer is no. I don't think we should be dishonest. At the same time, we need to acknowledge that the enormous market for these kinds of rituals that are being somewhat duplicitously understood as scientific means that there's a need. There's a very real human need for whatever it is that these rituals supply. And we need to meet that need or people are gonna start sneaking it in through the science back door. <laughs> Allow yourself to float in a sea of chi. The popularity of alternative therapies cannot be denied. Obviously, these rituals are providing something to their users, meeting some sort of need. But what is it? We'll just introduce ourselves, maybe sharing what drew you here. Um, what drew me here was the book, It's Not About the Horse by Wyatt Webb, uh, about how horses mirror uh, emotion. Feeling like I'm going through a lot of changes, kind of like cutting everything out of my life as I know it. I think that this is a little bit of a reset for me. Equine therapy involves one-on-one -on -one and group groundwork with horses with a trained facilitator that will guide you through how to be with a horse and interpret a horse's behavior to unlock your own healing. So as you go around to each horse, you can start to see other things, not only that you're feeling, but they're noticing. They are very peaceful, gentle animals that just learn how to respond to energies. So if it feels aggressive, they're gonna to wanna to move. 
away from that. If it feels soft, they will respond accordingly. With Katie, we went outside and did a one-on-one -on -one heart connection with the horse. So They help us remember what it is to be accepted as we are, loved as we are, and supported. And so that can move people to tears, which is often tears of release. Yeah, I feel like it's Ugh. anger at like letting, um, just letting people take too much space or take something yeah. from me, I guess. Okay, what did they think? It's okay to drop the anger. Healing is a byproduct of letting through more of who you actually are versus the masks we've learned to wear. And it felt like every time I was tense, like she would start to shift. Yeah, I feel heavier, but in a good way. Like more, more rooted? More grounded, yeah. yeah. I totally get skepticism to energy work or emotion, but when you can see your emotions mirrored in front of you, like when you can see a horse is gonna walk away from you every time you feel frustrated, you feel nervous, and they're gonna come in close to you every time you feel your worth connection, that's pretty measurable. You can see that. Going to see someone and talking to somebody once a week, how are you doing? Well, this is how I feel, okay. Like that's an intervention and that might make some people feel better. You just need to be honest about what the outcome is that you're getting and it, it would be, I think, you know, dishonest to say that, that you can get this kind of measurable effect. The other thing that you hear that's always associated with all of these therapies or these modalities is the idea that they will heal you. Are you comfortable with that? When you're really worried about something, it can cause physical problems. You can have a panic attack, and a panic attack can cause you to breathe, right? So the separation between what heals you psychologically and what heals you physically, there's not a clean, bright line there. The science advocate in me finds it difficult to accept that there's a role for these alternative therapies when it comes to health. Time to try this out for myself. Could you tell me a little bit about what you did? You were waving some things. What's going on there? Scanning. Did you find anything particular about me from doing the Reiki? So tension here. あ、こちらが痛いかなと思ったんです。そう、テンションヒア。あ、こっちだけ。プレスダウン。頭もちょっと疲ってらっしゃるし、あと目が疲れてらっしゃる。目の神経が for sure, my eyes are tired, and my brain's tired, too. <laughs> so do you think that all the stress in the world right now, that people turn to things like Reiki, as a release. を
I do. That was a very pleasant and meditative experience. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Ah, so I did Reiki, and it was a, a genuinely pleasant experience. Uh, you know, what's the argument against that? There's a study that no one ever really talks about that looked at Reiki. They had uh, Reiki practitioners who were nurses. They had nurses that didn't believe in Reiki but were willing to do the same kind of movement. And they did math calculations in their head. And then the third group didn't get anything. They got the, you know, here's the magazine to read during your chemotherapy. The two groups that had somebody with them felt better than the group who was left alone during their chemotherapy. But there was no difference between the person doing the math calculations in their head and the person doing the Reiki stuff. So the fact that people like someone paying attention to them and they feel better by someone acting caring towards them is no surprise. But to say that that's an energy flow, I think is, uh, is perhaps not grounded in science or the available data. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I found it pleasurable. And you know me, I went in as a skeptic, right? <laughs> and it was just a lovely, experience. What if you found out she was doing math calculations in her head at the same time? Would it have made you feel any different? You know, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I think perhaps it would have. You know, I, I think part of it for me was this act that she was committed to. So many of these therapies have at their core the idea that we have this energy running through our, our body. Is that something that we need to debunk, really? It's a word that has a very definite definition in physics, and it sounds very scientific, but we also use it extremely broadly. It's like, I'm just feeling low energy today. And so it is a word that is very easily used to give an aura of hard science. Do you think it could also be misleading, right? Misleading to the public that are, are looking for an efficacious treatment? Yeah, absolutely. They're not really engaging in science. They think their practice is important, and so they're gonna do whatever it takes to get it in the door. And we need to be honest about the fact that they're supplying something that the current medical system obviously can't. But so often, Alan, they are marketed to the public or explained to the public as if this is scientifically validated, and that's how it's presented. Only 200 years ago, you had to do the reverse. So if you had a scientific discovery, right? Darwin comes up with evolution. It's like, you had to justify it in terms of religious vocabulary, which was the dominant truth-making vocabulary at the time. So you say, well, evolution exists, but it's just like God's plan. Now the tables have turned, and the dominant truth-making language form is that of science. And so people are having to take what I would call, broadly speaking, spiritual truths and couch them in the language of science. We can't just love each other. We have to love each other because a study showed that it increases your well-being according to these metrics, which are empirically verifiable. I think that's just a bad way to approach understanding the value of these techniques. Of all the alternative practices getting attention right now, there's one undisputed king, mindfulness. It's been said that we're in the middle of a mindfulness revolution, and there are so many mindful products out there. You've got mindful candles, mindful furniture, mindfulness coloring books. You can be mindful holding your baby. You can be mindful with your cat. You can be mindful with your dog. You can be mindful with your house plants and mindful while you're drinking your coffee. So Mike, you're a scientist that studies mindfulness. Tell me what you think mindfulness is. Mindfulness is being present in the moment. Simple. That's being it? Being present in the moment. Just listening to your breath, being aware of what's happening in your body, expanding that space to be aware of the sounds around you. That provides you with this kind of natural calmness and then connection to being present. I'm a science geek, you know, my, my gut reaction to all this stuff is, oh, it's new agey, it's, it's spiritual stuff. It could be quite scientific. Mindfulness and meditation practice can really help in some pretty pragmatic ways to help deal with anxiety, to help deal with depression, stress, pain. But then there's others like executives and organizations that are looking for self-exploration, so self-mastery. How can we elevate our skill sets to the next level? I'm not a spiritual guy, but I can appreciate relaxation and improving my mental skills. Uh, 
I'm here in Kyoto to experience the real deal. ではよろしくお願いしますでは本当に自由に楽に座っていただきたいと思いますそしてまずですねこの部屋にある香りそれから音に意識を向けてください次は身体の感覚へ意識を向けていただきたいと思いますちょっと練習としましてはまず右手をまっすぐ伸ばしてくださいリラックス例えば指先の方でかすかにこう電気が走ったような感覚であったり何か体の中で流れゆくエネルギーのようなものを感じれますかメディテーションは大きなパーツのテンポルこれは大きく私は3つメディテーションの意味です。これは大きく私は3つメディテーションの意味です。これは大きく私は3つあると思います。えー、1つは何もしない時間を持つことです。2つ目がですね今ここっていうのを大切にできる力を養うこと3つ目というのは自分人間というのは自然の一部であるとこういうふうに理解していくことだと思います Being mindful, does meditation have a, a spiritual element to it? 仏教伝来、えー、以降常にやってきておりますしえー、とございます、まあスピリチュアルっていうのは日本人が聞く場合はちょっと解釈が難しい部分がまあそうですねやっぱり目に見えない、えー、ものの意識例えばまあ本当に呼吸であったりそれから周りの環境とのこのつながりという意味で、えー、感じ直すという意味では非常にスピリチュアルだと思います。After experiencing a Buddhist temple, it's obvious the practice has deep historical and spiritual roots. But what if you don't believe? What we are doing, I think, in the United States is beginning to translate that into a secular sort of process. That you don't have to necessarily believe in Buddha, you don't have to believe in necessarily God. You can experience many of the benefits of meditation and being present at the moment by these simple practices. And now, those practices can be found on our phones. The mindfulness apps are probably one of the best known. Parts of this industry. And mindfulness is, of course, big business, right? In fact, the leading meditation app, Headspace, has been valued at over $250 million. Even celebrities like Jimmy Fallon and Ellen DeGeneres call themselves fans. I'm in San Francisco to meet with one of the app's most unlikely users. So you're copying. In a day,、uh, what kind of stresses are you coming across? The biggest stress that we face is you're always in this state of hypervigilance. For example, I've been to a call where someone was shot, someone's bleeding, and I'm first on scene and I have to deal with that. I've got parameters secure the scene, get this person medical aid. But then what happens afterwards? How do I deal with that? It's psychologically draining. 100%. And it's constantly a battle that officers, including myself, have to face daily and hourly. So you've tried to look for strategies to really deal with that kind of psychological pressure. What are the, some, some of the things you've tried? So I started delving into meditation and this app called Headspace. And does it work for you? It does. The beauty about Headspace is you're just giving yourself 10 minutes to just kind of check out and just see what your mind is doing. And it doesn't need to be perfect. Do you really need an app to do this? I don't think it's 100% necessary. Me personally, I like the idea of an app. You know, I'm just some blue collar police officer, and no one's gonna expect me to be meditating. Why am I meditating? How did I get into it? I like the idea of technology and being engaged because I can see that I'm making progress. So I think it's a great thing. It's, it's interesting because, you know, you, people do think of meditation, I think, traditionally as being kind of out there, being a little new agey. But ironically, it helps you be a better police officer. Very true. In our culture as police officers, there is this resistance to meditation because it seems very woo woo. So, what do your colleagues think? They give me a hard time. Yeah, I get, <laughs> I get razzed a lot, but. I, They're constantly asking me for advice. So I know what I'm doing is working. Has it made a difference? The mindfulness has brought just this level of clarity and presence, and I think engagement for me that I can battle those stresses at work and then come home and, and still be an excellent father and an excellent husband.
So it doesn't matter if someone's using an app or whether they go to a temple in Japan, it's getting to that place, whatever works for them. Yeah, and being able to incorporate it into your everyday life. There isn't one way to meditate. People have different routines of sleeping. But once they're asleep, sleep is the same. Likewise, there are different routines and different ways to prepare the mind for meditation. There can be different uh, practices which are better for different people. And as long as we're able to get to that state of uh, relaxed awareness, who cares? Mindfulness is said to improve sleep, improve relationships, productivity, and basically our lives. But how much truth is behind the hype? Scientists are starting to study mindfulness more and more. Just look at the increase in the number of papers published on mindfulness. There is a growing body of research that suggests some benefit. So heel down, toe up. So we are stretching. In this case, we are stretching the left leg and 100% on the right. So what kind of people come to take Tai Chi with you? Younger people and older people, people from all walks of life. Shift and turn, and hips are straight forward, 70, 30. 70 on the front leg and 30 on the rear leg. And hold this posture, please, for correction. Why do you do Tai Chi? My mom is old and she can't get out of a chair and I didn't want that to be me. What brought you to Tai Chi? High blood pressure, back aches, headaches, that type of thing. Did Tai Chi help? I wanted to see if Tai Chi would help. And I no longer have back aches. So you're trying to create rigorous clinical trials that produce objectively measurable results. Tell me about your results. When people practice Tai Chi, it's that ability to respond effectively to a particular virus, the increased in the Tai Chi group and not in the control group, and increased to the same level as if they got a vaccine. And when we gave both the Tai Chi and the vaccine together to people, we found that that increase was even greater. In fact, the people that got both actually had immune function like people 30 years younger. So that to me was a very convincing evidence that Tai Chi is not just in your head, <laughs> that it's producing changes in your body that are physiologically relevant and important for disease outcomes. One of the things I've always tried to do is try to dissect, you know, what is the active component of Tai Chi that's producing the benefit? And we found that when people were assigned to the Tai Chi group, their overall activity didn't change. Why? <laughs> because instead of walking or doing some other exercise, they were practicing their Tai Chi. So that raises the question, what is it about Tai Chi that may be important? Practicing Tai Chi in order to actually execute the movements, you have to be present in the moment. So people are getting into that space of mindfulness. So the active ingredient, the secret sauce, is mindfulness? I think so, because we can replicate the findings that we have with Tai Chi with mindfulness. Because the findings show that you can improve depression and you can improve sleep problems and you can decrease stress and you can improve the immune system. All really important outcomes. But we do not know whether that translates into decreases in the rates of cancer recurrences or cardiovascular disease or diabetes. You know, do you think that we're trying to legitimize something that has this more spiritual roots uh, with scientific inquiry? Yeah, I think that's what we're doing. That's how many of our contemporary minds work. Does this work? Is it effective? What do I need to do? How many minutes? What's going to happen to my cortisol level? There's that part of that mind that needs to get satisfied. When I go and I train people, the first thing I look at is, okay, what is it that's going to be most effective for them? So when you look at athletes specifically, they're really motivated by really understanding more of this quantified approach towards how to excel. One of the athletes that Michael works with is an ultramarathoner, Colin Nanka, a successful New York executive who's completed eight of these extreme challenges. Colin, I think most people can't imagine running an ultramarathon. It must be insane. It's pretty intense. 
we're running about a marathon a day, every single day for six days. You definitely go through a ton of range of emotions. I like to think that you go through all of the range. You know, if I look at this past race in Patagonia, I was running in a team. The first couple days, we ran really well, and so we were on a high and we felt good. And the third day, um, I had trouble. It was really challenging. Wow. I was in pain. I was slower. How's the toes? Uh, I'm doing okay. You get really sick sometimes. You can't take food in. You can't take water in. At those times, you know, you just got to be really centered. You got to really slow the breath down. As I got through that, I was able to see the beauty around me, even when the body was in, you know, 10 out of 10 pain mode. So in those tough moments, what does meditation do? What does mindfulness do? You just start to get that consciousness in your mind of, you know, there's struggle here. And how do I shift my mindset? And so in those moments, I think I have the ability to visualize my way through those obstacles. You got to lean into the challenge and soften it. And so it just allows me to be a lot more clear, a lot more focused. That was what helped me finish the race. What compels you to do this? Like, what do you enjoy about it? The things that I think about and that I learned through the training really helps me do my job better and just think more clearly. It's all about learning. And I really felt like in the last two, three hours of this last race after running for 30 hours, you know, there was learning opportunity there for me. And I'm able to look back on that and uh, see growth in myself. As research continues to unfold, it raises an interesting question. How much science is needed before traditional practices can be viewed as having a role in public health systems? Other countries have already embraced some traditional practices. In Japan, for example, forest bathing became part of the public health program in 1982. Since 2004, the Japanese government has spent over four million on research exploring the benefits of being in nature. It has even designated dozens of forest therapy trails across the country. You're really one of the world's pioneers in this area. What benefit are people getting from being out in nature, even when it's raining? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about some of the research you've done. これは日本の63カ所の森と都市で約1週間かけて756人のデータを取って森に行くことによって脳前頭前野の活動が沈静化する。で自律神経活動の中の副交感神経活動が高まるコルチゾール濃度これはストレスホルモンですけどそれが低下するということを明らかにしました Do you think one of the reasons that people are so attracted to this kind of therapy is because of the intense stress that people are under あのまさにその通りですで2008年に都市に住む人の方が田舎に住む人よりも多くなるこれ世界中全員なんだよ全体の中でということが明らかになりましたですからもう一度人の体が自然対応用にできていることを上手に使ってストレス社会を乗り切るともっとみんなが関心を持って森自然を上手に使うことによって先ほど申し上げた予防、医療費の削減にいうようなことが大事で、そのために我々は科学的なデータを提出しているということです。In some ways, forest bathing highlights an effort to mix science with a traditional approach to stress reduction. If the evidence base for this kind of activity becomes robust, could we see more of this in public health systems throughout the world? When people are under a lot of stress, the inflammatory genes are actually being expressed. And inflammation is one of the biological pathways that leads to diabetes risk, cardiovascular disease, maybe even certain cancers, and also depression. And so the Tai Chi and the mindfulness both 
decrease the expression of those inflammatory genes. What we're trying to do is take an approach that's very simple and deliver it globally. There's no doubt that reducing chronic stress can have huge benefits. But what about some of public health's tougher problems? You've seen a huge increase in the consumption of opioids over the last 20 years, and uh, we're nowhere near reaching the peak as far as we can tell. Is it just because it's making the medication available? It's, it's getting the medication out in the market? Yeah, it's all about access. They're cheap, they're easily available. There's an assumption that these are good medications for handling chronic disease, but that may not necessarily be the case. We estimate anywhere between 15 to 19% of the population lives with chronic pain. If you've got pain, it makes sense to use a painkiller. And we know that opioids can be effective for helping pain, but over the short term. And when we're talking about chronic pain, we're talking about pain over the course of months, years, decades. How we're prescribing opioids, particularly for chronic pain, that's gone hand in hand together with the rise in the opioid crisis. So one of the things that you've been exploring is the possibility of alternative approaches like meditation, like mindfulness. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a family doctor also practicing chronic pain. When people come to me, I know they're coming for relief of their pain, but there's a lot of suffering that goes along together with their pain. What we've seen is that meditation can have a direct analgesic effect, so it can act like a pain reliever, and it can actually reduce how much the pain bothers and interferes with our day-to-day -day life. There's this dual effect, and that addresses both the pain part, but also the whole experience of chronic pain. So how do you think meditation might be used or mindfulness might be used in the context of this crisis. Let me be clear, I, I, don't, I don't see meditation as a, a sole uh, solution to the opioid crisis. It's one part of a very uh, multifaceted approach. There's this very strong pressure for practicing docs to start deprescribing opioids or tapering opioids, which is all well and good. But if you're not offering somebody an alternative to manage their pain, what are we doing for them? Nicole, tell me about your, your condition. Endometriosis basically means that the lining of my uterus grows in other parts of my body other than my uterus. My mother had endometriosis and she said, it's more painful than childbirth. The doctor gave me a morphine prescription and said, this is what you can use to help yourself. Then after I went to the specialist, they recommended chemo drugs and a drug that would put me into early menopause. And I just thought there has to be a better way than like surgery or even a hysterectomy or something. So that's when I started to really pursue alternative medicine and see if there were other options for me. So did you try the conventional medicine? Did you try the morphine? I did try the morphine. I've tried it a number of times. Every time I just felt like I was putting poison in my body. I'd be sick for days, I'd throw up from it, sometimes I'd hallucinate, and I was just like, I can't walk around in like everyday life being high on morphine. Given the current opioid crisis, can you see how this is a, a social problem? Oh yeah, because for me, when I was in this desperate situation, it was like someone was giving me this bottle that I was like, I need relief and I need it now. I can so see how that is a really slippery slope. So you have had the pain and you've tried acupuncture. Tell me about those results for pain management, specifically for the endometriosis and minimizing the cysts, definitely the acupuncture is running at the front of the race. Some people see this as devoid uh, of evidence. Uh, what's your response? I feel like science has only taken me and my body so far. The something else has given me comfort, has given me a spiritual connection, has given me a rhyme and reason. And I really feel like having these tools, I don't have to be afraid of the illness. If acupuncture keeps somebody from being on opioids and developing complications from that, then, then that might be a form of harm reduction. But I don't want the precious few health dollars that we have in this country paying for the acupuncture to cure a condition when that's not what it can do. So I think that it's really important when we're offering something as a medical therapy 
to be able to say that the science says this. As a society, we want to know if we're going to be gearing resources towards an intervention. Uh, we want to know that we're going to get good bang for our buck, that we're going to be providing value to people. They do need to be studied. You want to have a reasonable suspicion that this is going to work for people and not going to put them in harm's way. I think that what we need to do is create a space for forms of therapy that are helpful to humans who are dealing with their relationship to their own suffering that don't have to masquerade as science. And we need to welcome them in, but also maintain a separation between the people with the white coats that are administering a certain kind of treatment and the people who are administering acupuncture and the people who are praying with you. It's allowing the body to fully release, releasing any holding in the face, the jaw, shoulders, the abdomen. And as the body stills and the mind begins to settle, the fact that you're breathing may become more evident to you. Meditation has been around for a long time, and I've never been compelled to take part until recently. But maybe that's the point. When the science started coming out, it really started opening a lot of doors and new opportunities to bring these benefits to people that would normally never even think about this twice. People like yourself. And I think more and more society is becoming more interested in something that's more secular, science-based, and pragmatic that they could bring into their lives because conventional religion, they're not interested in those anymore. And so they're looking for these alternative ways to support themselves. And it's no secret that our digital world is stressed out. People are looking for ways to cope. These alternative therapies seem to be satisfying a need. When I've gone to these practitioners, I found it pleasurable, right? I sort of, you give in to the ritual and it gives you an excuse to not be looking at your phone that gives you these moments that are pleasurable and maybe even therapeutic. It's sad that we need excuses to relax. We feel like we're obliged to our work. And so we got to check our phone. Everyone has to be doing something productive all the time, even though the truth is we need just moments of relaxing. We need just moments of chilling out. If you give it a, a meaningful context, I'm going to meditation, I'm going to acupuncture, I'm going to Reiki, it's valued. And there's a reason for it that isn't present if you're just saying you want to relax. It's important to remember that not all practices are created equal, and we need to guard ourselves from misinformation and hype. If people enjoy cupping and that's what they like to spend their money on, and it's not gonna prevent them from accessing appropriate care, I don't need science behind that, that's okay. So I think it just depends what you're selling, right? Are you selling health? or are you selling pleasure? And I think that's why people sort of conflate all this, that if it makes you feel good to do something, that's not wrong. But it is wrong to tell you that this could cure your disease. Western medicine doesn't have cures for everything. Um, and as we sometimes see patients who are so desperate that they're quite vulnerable. And this is what concerns me. Perhaps with certain practices, like mindfulness, there may be measurable benefits and a kind of mixing of spirituality and science. It's not a medical intervention, but it's a lifestyle intervention uh, that has brought application to the population. It's something that they can be empowered to do themselves, to help them sleep better, to help with their depression, their anxiety, maybe even improve their physical health. Exercise is a great intervention for health, but it only works if you do it. And meditation is the same way. You've got to make the time and you've got to make the space and incorporate it into your everyday life. And while we understand the value of being physically active, it might be time for our overstressed and overstimulated culture to learn how to put aside time to notice nature, be present in the moment, and breathe. <laughs>